Well, James, thank you so much for for taking the time um, to speak uh, with me today and, and to join this uh, conversation series that we have at King's College London. Um, I thought I might start um, the discussion by going back to the the eve of the uh, 60th anniversary of the United Nations when the Secretary General endorsed and presented the report uh, of a high-level panel on threats, challenges and change. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said in there that the sort of six kind of clusters of threats that we really need to be concerned about now and in the future, one of those was transnational organized crime. Now I'm wondering when you see things like that in a document, <clears throat> you obviously wonder why it was included at the time, but also uh, whether that was just, as it were, you know, the fashionable thing and the right thing to do. There has been a lot of emphasis since the early 90s on human security and so on and so forth. So what I'm getting at is what was the what was new about the nature of that particular threat. But also, I think the other thing I want you to perhaps to get on to later is how that uh, threat has evolved and changed and in particular perhaps draw on some of the work that I know you have done and are still doing on the relationship between criminal and, and, and political power. So why did the SG include it at the time and how has the threat evolved? Great questions, Mats. And, and just to begin, thanks so much for, for including me in this series. It's great to be part of it and to have the chance to talk with you again about this topic that we've been noodling away at for a while now. I think your, your question is helpful in that it places the high level panel report in, in its time. And we, have to, and we have to treat the document on those terms. I think the short answer I'd say as to why organized crime was included in there was as a reminder. Uh, but I, I mean that in a particular way. And so let me actually just step back further in, in history, back to the early nineties to, to give a sense of how we got to that moment in 2004 and, and why the, the SG and the panel felt it necessary to have that reminder. The, of course, at the UN, the early 90s were a period of high optimism about the potential of multilateralism. Cold War was over, the uh, stalemate in the Security Council, the, the blockage had been removed structurally, there was a chance now for New World Order, the there's a very positive feeling about the potential of international cooperation uh, and globalization. But then as the 90s unfolded, we also saw, particularly in places like Italy with the mafia posing a direct threat to the state, killing Falcone and Borsellino, uh, that, that there, was the, um, there were emerging actors on the international stage. And some in fact saw corporations in this regard, which seem to be beginning to show signs of, of agency at the international level, of acting independently of states, of contesting their power, of controlling violence, deploying violence in interesting ways, and increasingly uh, across borders in, in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, to some extent, West Africa, there were, there were at least in the minds of some Western intelligence analysts, growing signs of the emergence of these transnational groups. So we get to 1999 and the, the US and Italy pushed for the creation of an international framework to deal with organized crime for the first time, the so-called Palermo Protocol. But then just as that's beginning to be implemented, uh, we have 9-11 and suddenly terrorism takes over as the bogeyman on the international stage. So it's no, the focus is no longer on organized crime as the shared other, apart from states, the, the enemy of all mankind. Now it's on terrorism. And organized crime pretty rapidly recedes into the background. People who worked on organized crime in all the bureaucracies at the time have, have told me they essentially had to frame everything they were doing in terrorism terms to get any access to, to resources or to policymakers' attention. Um, but the contrast between the, U the way the UN dealt with organized crime and the way it began dealing with counterterrorism was quite strong. 
So the organized crime framework, the Palermo Protocol, was a classic treaty, is a classic interstate um, consent of all involved uh, approach to dealing with this external actor. Whereas the, the approach that the UN began to adopt on counterterrorism was really quite different. Many of your, your viewers will, will you know, know all about the, the tendency of the Security Council to adopt a more legislative approach to dictate norms that member states would have to internalize. Uh, and that began to be seen quite quickly as a sign of UN overreach. And then of course, we had the slide into Iraq, uh, the tragedy there, the very strong sense that the, the West had me melded the concept of, or, or really adulterated the concept of counterterrorism for quite different and distinct purposes. Uh, and so, I, and then all, all the very difficult issues with the relationship between the US and Anand, I think, and Anand was really at a low point in his uh, secretary generalship at the time the, the panel was, uh, was working, it was seen as an opportunity for a reset, a reframing and a reminder that there was this other way of doing business. So I think it was partly about reminding uh, com the international community that had become rather preoccupied with terrorism, that if we were thinking in long-term trends, uh, the changing threat posed by organized crime was worthy of attention, but I think it was also a gentle way to remind the, the community of states, the, of uh, members of the United Nations, that there was this other law-based way of cooperating to deal with these external non-state actor threats. Uh, that's, a, that's how I see it really as, a, as an opportunity for the SG to remind the membership of the potential of the UN in, in that way. I wonder whether, I mean, if we take the story uh, forward and how the nature of the threat has evolved, and and I wonder also whether uh, the the potency of the threat and the ways in which it has been affected by by technological change, and we didn't discuss discuss that now, but 2004 it, it makes us or me at any rate begin to look old because that's quite a long time ago and a, quite a great deal has happened already since then. And I wonder whether there is a, a another dimension to, I mean, I, t I totally share your, your understanding of this partly being a reset and drawing attention to the, to the ongoing thread. But what other developments, perhaps already at the time, but even since then, have given sort of added urgency to the, uh, to, to the ability of transnational organized uh, criminal networks to operate and pose a threat? Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Mats, to, to start with this idea of technological change. So already in the Palermo Protocol and the, the focus on transnational organized crime, there was a recognition that, that organized criminal groups that had traditionally been seen as fairly parochial and, and a problem for individual states to deal with were tapping into the mechanisms, the technological infrastructure of communications, of lower cost transport, uh, the, the regulatory infrastructure around globalization to transnationalize. And that, that's a very important empirical part of the story. But I, when you look back at the depictions of transnational organized crime in those days, to be frank, they seem a little quaint. Mm. Uh, and, and the way that we treated this issue in the zeitgeist, you go back and watch the, you know, the blockbusters of the 1990s yeah. uh, and the, the villains in those movies uh, tend to be essentially classical uh, organised crime writ large on a global stage. Mm. And what I think we missed in that story at the time was the way that uh, organized crime tapping into that global system of globalization would actually change the relationship between the actors in those quote unquote criminal groups and elites, political and business elites, because many of the things that the organized criminal groups wanted to get out of globalization, in particular, the disembedding of capital from local territorial control. So tax havens, the ability to move capital offshore, the ability to work through uh, shell companies. Uh, all of that infrastructure was equally something of interest to 
uh, political and, and other, in some cases, for example, military elites around the world. So it led to the emergence of this uh, kind of dislocated, disembedded, to use John Ruggie's term, um, or to turn that on its head, uh, neoliberal globalization, where elites were, were existing on a transnational plane, but not necessarily anchored into local tax structures or local security structures uh, to control um, to control governmental power. And, and so it's that shift in the, the nature of the governmental uh, system uh, that comes with globalization that I think we missed in our earlier narratives around this and that has had a pretty uh, profound effect for our understanding of, of what this means from a, a security perspective. Um, now, I, I don't mean by emphasizing this transnational aspect to suggest that this doesn't have a local aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, what we see when we look at organized crime is that, like, is that like politics, it's all very, very local. It's often about control down to the level of city blocks uh, and the provision of services. They might be very simple social or market regulation services. It might be the provision of violence itself that's the key service it's needed or the control of violence. Uh, so, but what we see time and again from, for example, Kingston in Jamaica, uh, through to Afghanistan, through to some of the conflicts in Africa, is that local armed groups, when they get access to the infrastructure of globalization, to transnational trafficking networks for arms, uh, in some cases for people, for drugs, they can tap into uh, those flows and their control of territory allows them to extract rents from controlling the passage of goods uh, or value through that territory. It, and it just transformed the game and allowed them to, to move up the value chain to develop wealth and power and indeed military capability that they hadn't previously, previously been able to develop, making them rivals to states uh, in, in many places uh, for the control of, of legitimate violence. And, and I say the control of legitimate violence because it's not just control of violence, they often compete in the sphere of legitimacy. And this is where, in a way, paradoxically, we actually come back to the transnational story because I think our failure earlier on to foresee the convergence of the criminal methodologies with uh, the methodologies of state controlling elites and indeed with intelligence services has meant that we weren't prepared for the convergence of uh, statecraft and criminal activity, uh, particularly around subversion and the use of uh, information operations, uh, the use of compromat and blackmail and extortion uh, on, a, on a really industrialized scale um, and often working through criminal actors. Now, this has a long history um, where we can go back, as I did in my book, Hidden Power, to look at the way that, for example, the US worked through the mafia uh, to achieve both military and political objectives offshore. And in fact, we have some evidence from the archival record that some of those techniques were directly learned by the CIA and before at the OSS from the British and the French who were using the same techniques in the Middle East. But I think it was tactical at that point. And what we see now is, is a more strategic converge or a convergence of strategic uh, thinking and methods between some of the criminal groups and some of the uh, some some states in in their uh, development and and deployment of of power uh, internationally. Well, I think that in a way you've sort of mentioned your your book um, Hidden Power, and of course, what you just mentioned goes to the heart of that, which I think is one of the most uh, significant and important contributions: the whole relationship between criminal and political power. And in a way, you're challenging sort of very traditional notions of crime being fundamentally essentially about profit making. Um, 
that there is a much more complex uh, relationship. I think another aspect of that, which you do bring out, though, that if this is the nature of the problem, and of course, we're talking a little bit in generalities, we haven't mentioned any countries or groups or anything, but mm -hmm. if the nature of the problem has changed, then some of the traditional uh, state-centric law enforcement mechanisms for dealing with that, treaty-based, legalistic approaches, are themselves going to be um, of you know difficult and of limited value and problematic. And I wonder whether um, what you are, 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 are suggesting, not necessarily how to deal with the problem, but how do we adjust, how do the UN, for example, adjust to the reality of the changing nature between criminal and political power? And again, I think we are very careful, I suppose, with the two of us in not mentioning specific names, but there are certain countries that have, you know, key member states of the United Nations, not just the United Nations, but permanent members of the Security Council that have often been drawn into the debate about the interface between um, uh, criminal and political power. Indeed, uh, your your book and your thesis opens with that wonderful quote from the former director of the of the CIA, uh, which I can't remember at the moment, but which goes right to the heart of the problem. Uh, so, so I wonder what you you, you think the sort of broader implications of the of this shift uh, really are. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a penetrating question. Mm -hmm. um, the the quote that you reference is is. Uh, a wonderful quote from an appearance, as you say, of a former CIA head before Congress, uh, an inquiry, talking about how if you run into a certain well-dressed gentleman in a, a hotel lobby on the, the banks of uh, Lake Geneva and have a conversation and he essentially you know, makes you an offer uh, to do X or Y, you may leave that conversation not really knowing if you've dealt with uh, someone in the commercial intelligence business in the state intelligence business or the criminal intelligence business, or indeed, if it's one person playing all three roles. And he, he being American, he's talking there about a, a Russian adversary. Uh, but I also made the point, I think, fairly early in the book that if you look at the perm five permanent members, we can actually find with fairly high confidence episodes in their fairly recent past for each of the five permanent yes. members. Yes. where they've worked through quite deliberately through criminal groups to develop and project power yeah. uh, internationally. So I don't think it's, you know, just empirically, it doesn't necessarily make sense to see this as emerging from a particular, um, a particular national or even bureaucratic culture. Um, these techniques are, you know, it's a bit of an arms race to develop and deploy these, these techniques between uh, different uh, security intelligence services. But what I do think is, is interesting and is going on now is, uh, to come back to the earlier part of your question, Mats, uh, is this challenge that the emergence of criminal methods in uh, fairly nakedly in the politics of some countries, and I would argue even in the last four or five years in the United States, the, challenges, the challenge that poses to our conception of a liberal international yes. order. Yes. Now, some people would argue that the UN Charter is not a particularly liberal document, that the, the human rights agenda, frankly, came along later and has been in some ways overlaid over what is essentially a fairly realist and balance of power, spheres of influence based uh, document. Um, but it's quite clear now that if we're going to accept an intertwining of political and criminal uh, methodologies internationally, it is a real challenge to our conception of a, of a rule of law, uh, both domestically and certainly internationally. And we now have um, certain powers, uh, and I'm thinking openly here of China, that are projecting a, a vision of um, legalized international relations that certainly Western scholars say translates better as rule by law than rule of law, mm -hmm. and which has at its core a, uh, a, a vision of common humanity of, human, of mankind or humankind that is very much based on the horizontal relationship between states and not interfering in the vertical relationship between states and their citizens.
And that's a fundamentally different proposition, I think, going forward, including for how we regulate uh, the relationship between states on the one hand, uh, non-state armed groups using criminal methods on the other hand, and people. Mm. If, if foreign states are not, uh, if it's not legitimate for foreign states to look inside that triangle, mm. then it leaves much greater space for uh, people to be uh, exploited and ruled through criminal and or violent means. Mm. Um, I wonder whether I, I might move on, uh, although it is very much related because you touched on it, uh, to look at, um, and it isn't really discussed at length in the high level panel report, but how the sort of operational environments and settings into which UN have found themselves thrust, um, either as peace building missions or peacekeeping missions, have often been distinguished by the presence of, of criminal networks engaged either in opportunistic criminal violence of a more systematic kind. Now, you have written in the past, I think, very interestingly about the kinds of challenges that poses for, for the UN uh, or for UN field operations. One of which, I mean, you mentioned earlier the competition for legitimacy, uh, particularly in very weak and fragile states where the state is unable or never has perhaps provided sort of fundamental public goods that you and I are, expect from the state. Uh, that void has been felt by criminal networks and therefore they enjoy a degree of legitimacy. I wonder whether you can sort of spell out a little bit the nature of the challenge faces uh, facing you and you and in some of these missions, but also uh, I mean, you know this much better than I do, how they have sought to respond to it. I mean, generating reports, thinking it through, and just what, what, what options there are. I mean, I think you have mentioned in the past that the, the, the route of combat, as it were, might not be uh, the right one, simply because you don't have the resources to do it. But also, if you do um, decide to combat organized crimes in these zones, you are actually... Uh, uh, provoking a, a reaction um, uh, locally uh, because they enjoy legitimacy and destabilizing the mission and making things more more difficult. I wonder what your thoughts are on the way that whole debate has evolved. You fell out there, James. Can you hear me? You f you froze briefly, James. Matt's hello. Hi, James. That's fine. I can hear you again. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that, and sorry to your listeners. Um, so, to to come to your question, um, I, I think the challenge here is, is twofold. Uh, <laughs> The first is actually a, a challenge in terms of the ability of the UN to compete with these groups in conflict environments. And, and I'll come to that in a minute, but I, where I want to actually start is the second part of the challenge, which is really a challenge of perception. That it's going to be hard to compete if you can't actually see the adversary and understand uh, its, its capabilities and indeed its intent. And you know, when I started working on these issues uh, in the UN context, I'd previously worked as the head of the Transnational Crime Unit in the Australian Attorney General's Department. And when I came to the UN context, it was around 2005, so soon after yes. the, uh, the high-level panel. And what I realised at the UN very quickly was that this issue was actually deeply marginal um, it, it, in the sense that the, the state representatives, and even I would say many, many if not, uh, the vast majority of UN officials in the Secretariat and, and certainly funds programs and agencies saw organized criminal groups, saw organized criminal activity as really peripheral to the central issues of the day. And uh, what I came to understand fairly soon was that the UN is a club of by and for member states. Mm. And these aren't member states. So just as just as the UN is is kind of reluctant to take corporations on their own terms, it was reluctant to take these groups on their own terms. Everything was seen uh, through the lens of seeing like a state. Yeah. Um, 
And so there was a lack of awareness, I would say, of the reality on the ground, on, of the actual governing power that many of these groups exercise, particularly in, or even in, because this is where the UN does have eyes and ears and boots on the ground, even in organized crime, con uh, sorry, in, in armed conflict contexts. And in those contexts, what we often saw was groups that might have a political manifestation or agenda or be perceived by the UN as fairly classical um, insurgents or, uh, or non-state armed actors were because of this same logic of globalization that I talked about before, increasingly being drawn into organized criminal activity. Didn't mean they were necessarily giving up their political uh, face or their political aspirations, but parts of the group would be increasingly sucked into the criminal activity. Those parts would become richer, more powerful, more important for the military capabilities, the access to munitions and, and weapons, and, and begin to dominate, as we saw, for example, in Northern Ireland, uh, begin to dominate the agenda, the internal agenda, the organization of, of the uh, armed group, even as the outside was ostensibly still a political military uh, framing. Um, and in the high level panel, this was framed in terms of state failure. So, you know, I think that tells you the extent to which it's all seen from the perspective yeah. of the state and there's a vacuum here, there's nothing there. The, the, therefore, the pol policy prescription is to project the state back into that space, not recognizing that there might actually be a governing entity or an entity That's fine, James. Can you hear me? You're coming back in again. I've lost That's your fine. sound. No worry. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can now. No problem. So I, I apologize. Um, no worries. Something's clearly unstable here. Uh, I, I was just saying there's a great new paper by Chris Blackman and others looking at what happens when a state projects power into, uh, into a, a space that it believes is, uh, is, ungoverned or potentially ripe for criminal governance. And uh, classically, we might think if the state projects power, then the criminal actor is going to back off. But what they find is actually the opposite. Uh, amongst me, There are many, many rich findings in this hugely important paper, but they find, th this is the one I want to pull out here, they find that actually that's the moment when the criminal actor, if it's looking to exercise governmental power, and it may not want to be the pol top political dog, but it might want to e exercise influence from below uh, as a hidden power, as I say in my book, that's where it ups its game and it increases its service provision, it uh, increases its, its security provision to remind the, the customer base, the, the citizens, of what it can do for them. When mm. the state's not there competing for that customer base, yeah, often it neglects those people to yeah. some extent. It just does the minimum necessary to maintain yeah. their loyalty. Yeah. But so the, the UN wasn't necessarily expecting that kind of pushback when it projected power into these places. Yeah. And what we find time and again is that it, it really struggles to read that strategic environment. It, it, yeah. it literally does not have the, uh, the, the staff with the skill sets to understand what's going on in the illicit and informal economies and to read who has power 
in those uh, economies in, uh, in, in situations in which the state and formal markets are not well established. Mm. So it really struggles, whether it's in Afghanistan, in the connections between insurgents and the drug trade, or in Eastern DRC, understanding the relationship between different armed groups and informal and illegal trade in minerals, uh, and later in wildlife, um, or in Haiti, uh, looking at the way that uh, local armed groups engage in criminal activity, extortion, kidnappings. It really struggles to read who is who, what is what, and to project a, a strategic dynamic scenario where uh, to, to war game it out. If I go in with this much power, then they'll come back with this. It just it just struggles time and again and misses, I would say, a big part of the of the game of what's going on in those places. As a result, um, the one place where there is a really interesting experiment is, is in Haiti, uh, between about two thousand and four and two thousand and eight, where the UN does actually seem to learn. And this this has a lot to do with the the command structure and the force structure at the time with a big Brazilian presence that had learned from uh, pacification of the favelas, in particularly in Rio. Not a great track record necessarily. Uh, a lot of harm um, projected onto civilians in, in some of those domestic uh, operations. And that is repeated, some would say, in the, in the bidonville of Haiti, that there are, that there are overly uh, heavy handed military operations. There's actually a UN special rapporteur, Philip Alston, who at the time looks into whether there are civilian deaths caused by the UN operation in Haiti. Uh, but, but there is internal learning within the, within the force and they do develop a more sophisticated plan of operations, uh, including uh, use of criminal informants uh, to develop criminal intelligence uh, a fusion center within the, within the force uh, to combine different forms of intelligence, uh, use of aerial surveillance to understand what's going on in these very dense uh, favela-like bidonville. Uh, and there is a more successful military intervention, highly revealing about what it takes, kind of investment and capabilities required to achieve success militarily against these groups. But then no follow-up. Well, that's a little unfair. There is follow-up. There's some work around decommissioning of these groups, attempts to adapt DDR uh, methodologies, but they're not successful. And frankly, they don't receive the same kind of resourcing and follow through uh, as the military effort uh, uh, achieved. And uh, my article on this is called The Futility of Force. To, to make this point that you may be able to develop uh, an effective military intervention against these groups, but ultimately they do operate not just on a military, but on an economic and indeed a small p political level. And if there is not a, a political strategy for winning the loyalty of the people in those places back to the state, then over time, these groups or, or, group, uh, or new groups using the same methods will emerge that occupy that space, that develop the governmental power uh, to uh, that, that, uh, that, that that gap uh, offers. Well, I think um, your, your point uh, that you made initially the, about the UN being a club by and for member states is, is critical. Uh, and I think it remains a sort of fundamental obstacle to thinking and getting a grasp of the strategic environment you just sketched. Um, I mean, you might find willingness among some members of the Secretariat and some evidence within missions that, that they, they realize the situation is more complex. But that fundamental membership nature of things, I think, is, is always going to be a bit of a challenge. I wonder, James, thank you so much for spending all this time. I, I, I do want to, to, to bring us up, if I may, to your current work. Um, Going back and having looked again this morning at the high level report, we, we mentioned a few times uh, in terms of specific examples, it does actually refer to human trafficking. It doesn't say all that much. And I think the, the recommendations for how to tackle it are, are very, are very um, uh, sort of limited. Um, but but you are now in, involved 
in working specifically on this issue, trafficking and modern slavery. And as you suggested in in separate conversation with me, you do see elements of sort of criminal governmentality um, shaping uh, trends here as well. And I wonder whether you could say a little bit about that work. I mean, the scourge of modern slavery is, is a horrific one, and it certainly does deserve attention. Um, I wonder whether you could could give us a sense of your current uh, work on this. Yeah, happily, Matt. Uh, you know, I was one of these people who sort of found their way sideways into this issue. And only when I really grappled with its scale did I have a sense of how it dwarfed some of the other things I'd been dealing with. The ILO estimates that 40.3 million people were enslaved in 2016. And just to give you a sense, that's, that's roughly one in every 185 people alive today. When you think about that, that's basically the size of the high school class that I had when I went through high school. Uh, it's pretty astonishing. Now, it's not, it's very unlikely that any of those 185 people I went to school with have been enslaved, which means that in somebody else's high school class, two people were enslaved. It's not distributed evenly around the world. It's, it's somewhat uneven, but it's also pretty astonishing just how ubiquitous it is. Mm -hmm. In the UK, for example, the official estimate from the government is that there are 10 to 13,000 people in modern slavery at any given time. And some estimates actually suggest that that might be an order of magnitude too low. So it might, might be up over 100,000. And what we mean by modern slavery is essentially that one person is being controlled as if they were owned by another. So it's a total loss of agency. The great theorist of, of slavery, Orlando Patterson, describes it as social death. Now, the UN comes at this from multiple different angles, depending on the particular framing of different funds, programs and agencies. So the main frame for the last 20 years has been around trafficking in persons, seeing this as a form of exploitation uh, conveyed, pervaded by uh, transnational organized crime, the connection to the issue we've just been discussing. But for many, many decades, uh, the ILO has been working on the related problem of forced labor uh, and also in the in Geneva, in the uh, UN human rights infrastructure, we have a whole separate um, set of mechanisms dealing with slavery per se and slavery, uh, slavery like practices is the term of art. And the danger here is that you have different parts of the UN holding different parts of the elephant and not necessarily seeing the big picture. Um, so when you start to look at that big picture, you begin to realize that while there is no doubt there are uh, very powerful, dangerous transnational organized criminal groups involved in both people trafficking and people smuggling, the difference being that smuggling doesn't necessarily lead to exploitation, uh, there, there's also deep structural dark drivers, particularly in the way we organize uh, global value chains, supply chains, that allow uh, the, the wholesale systemic exploitation of vulnerable people in weak institutional environments. And it might not be organized crime that's generating this outcome. It might actually be legitimate business. Mm -hmm. So legitimate business that is looking to offshore uh, work down, down through long global supply chains, again, a product of globalization to go back to what we discussed earlier and is increasingly disarticulating the structure of that supply chain so that the, the large parts of profit are captured at the top and most of the risk falls to the workers at the bottom of the supply chain who work often in very precarious uh, conditions. So, for example, uh, the iPhone, you know, 40% of all of the profit goes to, to Apple everything else is divvied up uh, along the supply chain. But the people who mine the, the coltan and other precious minerals in Eastern DRC, back to that actual UN intervention case we were talking about earlier, are getting, in some cases, literally nothing. They're often working off a bonded debt uh, and, and in many other cases, next to nothing. Um, or take the case in the UK of uh, Boohoo, the, uh, the the online fashion retailer, you know, that's an interesting case because it's not a case where we have a long transnational supply chain. It's uh, the internet and internet sales that have been the technological change driving exploitation um, just within the shores 
of, of the UK, but still the same situation of weak regulation allowing exploiters to exploit vulnerable people. In, in the UK case, they're often uh, migrants with limited language skills and, and working in informal uh, and poorly regulated work contexts. So when, as a, as a social scientist, as I began to understand the scale of these problems, uh, you, you know, it was quite a, quite a magnitude different to some of the uh, issues I dealt with previously in terms of the scale of abuse and its ongoing nature. And then as a policy researcher, I began thinking, well, what are the levers that we're not pulling to achieve change here? And one of the things, uh, when I was at the UN University for Centre Policy Research, we identified two levers that we thought needed to be brought into this discussion. One was high finance. So when we look at how abolition has been achieved at scale, historically, high finance has played a key role, including in the UK. Abolition in the West Indies was only achieved through the, the largest syndicated loan in history at that point, organized by the Rothschild Bank, uh, which was only paid off by the UK taxpayer about eight or 10 years ago, the, the last interest on that loan over 180 years. And the money, of course, didn't go to pay off or compensate the, the slaves or the victims. It was to buy out the slaveholders, to mm -hmm. give them enough uh, income to move them away from that business uh, model and into one based on free labor. So we worked at UNU to uh, develop a, an initiative called Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking, which works with banks and investors and governments all around the world. Uh, we have an initiative in Asia Pacific where institutional investors with around 6 trillion US dollars uh, under management are working with companies to address these issues. And then the other, other big lever that we didn't see being pulled was the development sector. When you look at the, at the practice of development actors, they, you know, it's kind of back to what we were just talking about with the UN and the high level panel. Organized crime and, and, and trafficking and, and forced labor are seen as very peripheral issues, not central to key questions of uh, productivity, GDP growth, uh, labor force participation, things like that. So we've just published a report called Developing Freedom, which shows how slavery actually uh, impedes development. We identify 10 different vectors, 10 drags on development. And of course, the corollary of that is that if you tackle those drags, if you remove them, you're actually going to unleash significant growth by giving people back their agency, their control of their own uh, labor and how the money from that labor is, is consumed, spent or invested you have all of these beautiful knock-on effects that run not only throughout the economy, but actually we have strong empirical evidence through multiple generations. Uh, in Africa, for example, one, um, one Harvard economist has identified that 72% of the income disparity between African countries and other developing nations is directly attributable to the participation of that country in the transatlantic slave trade, because there's enough diversity in Africa that you can see how much the, uh, the participation for how long in that transatlantic slave trade uh, affected its, its multi-generational growth, innovation, productivity, female participation, population growth. All of these things are factors uh, that, uh, that tying into sustainable development over time. So it's been very eye-opening for me and really, again, goes, goes to this central point that when we're, when we're thinking about uh, organized criminal activity at scale, we have to be very careful not to see the problem uh, just within the narrow confines of our traditional uh, mindsets and our state-based uh, approaches. In this case, it's all about seeing uh, how the system develops along the global value chain and organizing responses along that, that value chain, uh, which requires not just interstate cooperation, but working, for example, with business in a pretty profoundly new way, a real challenge for, for the global development system. Well, that's an extremely uh good note on which to end i i think um i will get from you the the detailed references of that report which i know is about to come out if it hasn't been released yet because i think there'll be a lot of interest to 
what strikes me as as fairly path-breaking work on the challenge of modern slavery, looking both at high finance as sort of the development side contribution to it. Um, and also- it, Thank you. It, it has actually just come out. It's at developingfreedom.org if anyone wants to, to visit. Okay, that. excellent, excellent. I'll put that up on the, on the site as well. Great. James, thank you so much uh, for taking time to do this. I thought it was absolutely terrific and will be of, of great interest um, to students and others who watch this, partly because it, it ties into so many of the different sort of weekly uh, thematic issues we've been looked at, you know, from, you know, specifically organized crime, but also to efforts at peace building and state building uh, the political economy of conflict and, and how these things are tied together. As you rightly said, I mean, one of the challenges we face is to try to step outside uh, the, the tendency to look through uh, traditional prisms of, of analysis and particularly a state-centric framework, which is still very powerful, not least because the UN is set up that particular way. But um, once again, James, thank you so much. And um, we will no doubt ask you back again, hopefully, you can come to London and we'll be there in a sort of physical presence after this wretched pandemic is all over. I would appreciate that. I'd enjoy that. And Mats, before before we sign off, just a, a thank you not only for uh, for this opportunity, but for your your guidance and and mentorship over quite a quite a long time now. I guess uh, best part of a decade, and it's really been a pleasure. And uh, to anyone out there who's ever thinking of trying to convince Mats to be a PhD supervisor. Do it he's fantastic if you can get him thanks so much terrific thank you very much